Welcome everybody to History Author Talks. I'm your host, Roger Williams, and I am uh, so thrilled to have everybody this evening um, for a uh, summer History Author Talk. We have a very special show tonight, and I'm very pleased um, with, uh, with our guests. I think this will be a terrific discussion. Uh, just to bring you folks up to date, um, I am uh, in full swing with my um, 501c3, my um, foundation, uh, 10crucialdays.org, where we give tours of the Washington Crossing Battles of Trenton and Princeton and the Princeton area. So if you want to learn more about um, Washington Crossing and the Battles of Trenton and Princeton, go to 10crucialdays.org. Um, also, um, we are moving forward with, uh, in development with the musical, the, uh, the Crossing in the Ten Crucial Days. Um, <clears throat> I'm very pleased that we're, work we're going to be working with Trenton High School uh, in the spring of 2022, where we're going to be putting on uh, a program uh, where the students are actually going to be reading um, and playing some of the characters in, um, in the... Um, the, the musical 10 Crucial Days. So if you want to learn more about that, you can just go to uh, thecrossingmusical.com. Uh, rev another Revolutionary War musical. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So with that, um, I um, want to encourage everybody to ask questions of our guests using the chat feature at the bottom of your, your Zoom screen. Uh, you can um, ask questions of our guests this evening. Uh, and I will be posting links to where you can purchase their books. And as always, any uh, the proceeds uh, to for the book sales go to the uh, library for the Sons of the American Revolution, of which I am a, a, a member. Um, and um, with that, uh, I'd like to welcome um, all of our um, uh, all of our audience. Um, and now I'd first like to introduce you to our partner in history. Um, our partner in history this evening is uh, Dr. Evelyn McDowell. Uh, Evelyn is the president of the board and uh, of the board of directors, the founder and a charter member of the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage. Uh, a lineage society for descendants of individuals of enslaved of uh, the enslaved in the United States of America. Dr. McDowell uh, has been researching her family for over 20 years and has identified over 35 enslaved ancestors. Dr. McDowell is an associate professor of accounting at Ryder University in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Uh, she is the co-chair of Ryder's task force on, on its history and slavery. And she's a <clears throat> member of the Princeton chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. So with that, I'm very pleased to uh, turn this over to uh, Evelyn McDowell. Evelyn? Hi, everybody. Uh, good, good evening. Good to see uh, so many people on the call that I know. And, I, and thank you so much for, for um, giving me this opportunity, Roger, to tell you about um, you know, our organization, um, the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage was started uh, in uh, 2013, and we start taking our first applications in 2016. It's a lineage society, much like the Daughters of American Revolution. You have to identify an, an enslaved ancestor, and a direct descendant, and, um, an, and a direct ancestor, and you must be a descendant, and you must follow that, um, it, that person all the way to yourself. You, know, you have to make a, gene, a genealogical connection to that ancestor. Um, we have um, a, uh, 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 registrars that take that information and uh, verify in, that in fact that uh, you, you are able to make that connection uh, to that ancestor. Well, the myth of this organization really is to, um, to uh, you know, commemorate the memory of these uh, amazing, wonderful people uh, that are of course our ancestors. Uh, without um, 
uh, what they went through, this country would not be what it is today. Um, so, you know, we feel that there's no other group that's better able uh, to, to tell their story uh, than, than their descendants. So this organization is all about um, in, encouraging people to find and connect themselves to their ancestors and to people who are also um, doing the same thing. Uh, we also, uh, one of the other uh, missions, uh, uh, one other part of our mission is to um, educate people about the history of slavery and, um, and how, um, it, you know, it was a, a particularly brutal um, and barbaric um, uh, form of slavery here in the United States. So we never want anyone to forget what our ancestors went through. Um, and, um, it, but we also don't want you to forget about how they endured and, and how they um, were able to still make significant contributions to this country um, in spite of uh, what was done to them. So that's what the organization is all about. We, uh, Roger has put in the chat uh, a, a, um, a link to our uh, webpage. Uh, on that webpage, you'll be able to find um, your app, the application. And um, the application process goes through, like I said, a, um, a, we, we have a registrar that connects and, and checks all that information. So I uh, don't wanna take up any more time, but if you have any questions later on, I'm gonna stick around for the entire um, the program and uh, be, be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Evelyn. I appreciate uh, your letting us all know about that. As, as Evelyn said, I put the link to uh, the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage website in the chat. Um, so with that, I now would like to introduce our next guest. Uh, Annette Gordon-Reed is the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard. Gordon Reed has won 16 book prizes, including the Pulitzer Prize uh, for History in 2009 uh, and the National Book Award in 2008 for the Hemingses of Monticello, an American family. In addition to articles and reviews of her other works, including Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, uh, The Race on Trial, Law and Justice in American History, Andrew Jackson, uh, she's also the co-author with Peter, Onuf, Peter S. Onuf for The Most Blessed of Patriarchs, who is also with us tonight. We'll hear more from him a little later. And uh, her most recent book, Juneteenth, um, the Gordon Reed uh, uh, is, um, was the, I hope I pronounced this right, Vivian Harmsworth Visiting Professor of American History at the University of Oxford. Queens College 2024, 2014-2015. Uh, Between 2010 and 2015, she was the Carl, uh, Carol K. Uh, Horsheimer Professor at Radcliffe um, at the Advanced Study of Harvard University. Uh, so with that, uh, and this, she has many other honors, um, all of them are on her biography at her website, which I will also post. But with that, I would like to, um, I'm very proud and pleased and honored to uh, introduce you to Annette Gordon-Reed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. I'm very happy to be here and glad that so many people have come to listen to us speak. Um, I am sort of an odd person out here. I'm a, I'm a Jefferson scholar, but my latest book is on Juneteenth. I talk about Jefferson and on Juneteenth. There's no book that I've written that he doesn't crop in someplace. Uh, but Juneteenth is very different from what I typically do. On Juneteenth is very typical, is different than what I typically do. It is a combination of a memoir and a history. Um, I talk about growing up as a Texan and I use my family story as a way of talking about Texas history. My editor and, and actually Peter's editor as well for our book, Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Bob Wild, had been after me for many years to write a book about Texas, but he wanted me to write a big book about Texas, a history book of Texas, and to sort of move from Virginia 
and Jefferson and the Randolphs and the Hemingses and that crew and talk about Texas and maybe my family <coughs> along with it. Um, I was here in New York last year, last summer, and school had gone virtual. I wasn't going down to Cambridge anymore. And I was here in New York, holed up like everybody else during the pandemic. And I did an essay for the New Yorker called on Juneteenth, talking about Juneteenth, uh, growing up in Texas and, and uh, celebrating Juneteenth. And I had done a book review of five books about Texas some months before that. So Texas was on my mind. And so when Bob raised this issue of, again, of writing something about Texas, I decided I want to do something, but I wanted to do something short not long. The Hemings is a Monticello is 800 pages if you add the notes along with it. And it is, it's a big book. It's a big family. There's a lot to cover, the generations of people in this one particular place. Uh, on Juneteenth is a series of essays about Texas and my family. It is, it talks about slavery in Texas. It talks about the fact that what I, my major observation to start the book is that people have an image of Texas that mires it or keeps it in the West. Texas is the Southwest. It definitely has a Western component of it. I don't deny that. But most people who live in Texas live in the Eastern part of Texas. And that was a part of the South. Uh, it was a plantation society. It began as a plantation society. The person that we considered to be the father of Texas. Stephen F. Austin was given the right, well actually his father Moses was given the right to bring, uh, to sort of develop East Texas, to bring settlers there. And Moses died and Stephen F. kept up his, kept up his mantle and brought settlers into Texas, the old 300 as they call them. And many of those people owned enslaved people. Stephen F. Austin express, expressly stated that slavery was needed he considered himself to be anti-slavery. He was one of those anti-slavery, but slave-owning people. Um, he was anti-slavery not because he uh, thought that it was morally problematic or that he cared about African-Americans so much as he didn't want to have so many African-Americans, the number that you would actually need to have a functioning slave society. So there was an ambivalence there that he, he, ex that he expressed about this. But he, he fully intended to have slavery as a part of, of Texas because he knew that they could not become a part of the cotton empire without it. So what do you do with a state where when most people think of it, the first thing they think of is probably a cowboy. But that's the image of Texas or a cattleman or uh, an oil man, that's the other one. And most, I'm sure many of you have heard of and if not seen the movie Giant that puts this out very, very well. It tells in its own way, the way t Hollywood does tell a history of a time uh, of, of Texas as settled by cattle people who were there on their vast acres of, of, of land. And they were interrupted by, rudely interrupted the way the film shows it by these oil men who came and uh, were pumping oil out of the land and would put them in conflict with the cattle owners. Well, then eventually, of course, in the movie, they come together. Uh, but what's left out of that movie is the plantation owner, the person who actually made the, 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 the for which the society was actually made, the moderns of the society that we know, the Texas that we know, obviously, there were cattle people in Texas when it was Mexican and, you know, the Spanish, this was an old tradition there. But the plantation society is not in giant. The racial conflicts that were caused by that are not in that. The racial conflicts there are between uh, Mexican Americans and Anglo Americans, which is legitimate, but I'm just saying this is something that was left out of it. So my book is to try to talk about those things in ways that make Texas explicable. I've spent a lot of my time as I've lived up here in the North trying to explain Texas to people. What's that about? And it comes from the fact that there's this whole history of slavery, of Jim Crow afterwards, of race, all of those things in that place that make explicable a lot of the things that seem inexplicable to people. We're going through a, a moment right now in Texas with a fight over what can be taught in Texas history. Can they talk about slavery? Can they talk about race? Uh, voter suppression. 
the issue of who gets to vote. This is all, these are live issues, things that have been going on since after Juneteenth, after slavery was uh, pronounced over in Texas, and then Reconstruction for a brief period, and then Jim Crow settles in and voter suppression. So my little book is a way of trying to explain this big state <laughs> that is so much in the news now, occupying maybe a disproportionate amount of the news now. And I, as was mentioned earlier, Roger was kidding with me about the timing of my book that I have to happen to have it come out just before uh, it became a national holiday. That was not planned. <laughs> I had no idea. I thought that it, this, this would be something that might happen later on in the year or next year, but it all worked out very well on that particular score. But I look forward to the conversation that Juneteenth, I hope that Juneteenth has sparked um, among people already and will continue to spark as the years go on. Well, thank you. Um, and for goodness sake, for a Vermonter like me, for somebody who can explain Texas, then, you know, it's amazing um, because uh, I've always thought Texas was inexplicable. But um, anyway, neither that's neither here nor there. It, no, it's such an important work, obviously. Um, and um, I was sort of half kidding, kidding with Annette about the timing of the book. Um, it The timing is perfect. Uh, and I think that it is something that uh, everyone should um, everyone should 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 buy and I have put the link to bookshop.org uh, the, the where you can purchase Juneteenth if you don't have it yet of course you can get it wherever you want but um, I've put everybody's books all together in the the link for um, bookshop.org so thank you Annette um, and I remind everybody if you have questions you can certainly send me the messages via chat Next, uh, we have Peter S. on a Thomas Jefferson Foundation Professor Emeritus uh, at the uh, Corcoran Department of History at the University of Virginia, Senior Research Fellow at the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, Specialist in History of the Early American Public. He's taught at Columbia, uh, the uh, Worcester Polytech, uh, Southern Met Methodist, Columbia. Um, oh, I, I mentioned that, sorry reading, <laughs> reading askew, um, before arriving at uh, University of Virginia in 1990. Um, Onuf's work on Thomas Jefferson's political thought, culminating in Jefferson's empire, the language of the American nationhood, uh, the mind of Thomas Jefferson, grows out of the earlier studies on American federalism, foreign policy, and political economy. As the co-author with Annette Gordon-Reed, recently published Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of Imagination, uh, and is Jefferson and the Virginians, Democracy Constitutions and the Empire that was published by Louisiana State University Press. So with that, I'm very pleased to uh, present Peter Ona. Peter. Thanks, Roger. It's nice to be here. Nice to be with my good friends, uh, Annette and Andrew in a program that's mostly about Jefferson, uh, but Jefferson's about America, as we'll talk more about this later. And Texas is part of America, and it may be the part of America that enables someone like Annette Gordon-Reed to make sense of American history. I should mention to you all that Annette uh, wrote a brilliant piece in the Times recently in which she suggested that Juneteenth is a complement in fact, may renew our understanding of July 4th. Uh, and the idea that uh, there was, to borrow a phrase from Abraham Lincoln, a new birth of freedom, well, for people who never had been free under Texas law, American law, the enslaved people of Texas, Juneteenth was a marvelous day, and a day that all Americans should celebrate. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the book that Annette and I wrote and published, I have to say it's a long time ago, I know. five years, uh, but uh, we have agreed to continue promoting this book forever uh, until I die. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, one of the continuing uh, book tour events that we're doing, Roger, and thank you for that. Uh, we get to talk again in New Orleans in person in October. We're very excited about that. 
Um, so this is a, a, a perennial uh, steady seller, our book. Now we thought when we wrote it that this would be, of course, the last word about Thomas Jefferson and the last word about Thomas Jefferson has been written many, many times. Uh, and it's sobering to think that not everybody in the world has read this book and they don't understand what we're saying about Jefferson. So that's why we need to continue promoting the book. I'm being only semi-facetious. Uh, what's wonderful about Annette, you will find Jefferson in Juneteenth. Uh, there's this thing about spending a lot of time with Jefferson. Uh, he's irrepressible. He keeps popping up in whatever you do. And that's for better and for worse. And I think that's the main attraction of Jefferson is that Jefferson is a fascinating seminal figure in American history. And understanding Jefferson is a way in, a way to understand what our larger project is all about. I'm gonna focus a little bit on setting up Andrew who has got the hot new book coming out and you have to buy each one of you several copies of it. It's gonna be wonderful, even if you didn't go to UVA. And of course we expect, I think it's been a requirement for every graduate to read it. Uh, but Andrew's gonna focus on the last thing Jefferson did. And the last thing that Jefferson did was infused with his hope for a better world hopes that were deferred repeatedly in his own life, particularly when it came to questions of reforming his beloved country, Virginia, making it a better place. When we think about Jefferson, we don't think about somebody who was the perfect man at the perfect moment, creating the perfect world. It was a radically imperfect world and Jefferson knew it. And it's that emphasis that I'd like to put on Jefferson as a man of the enlightenment, as we say in the subtitle of our book, but a man who was committed to fulfilling the potential, and I say fulfilling, the potential of Republican self-government. In some ways, Jefferson's experience and what he has to say is more timely than ever, precisely because of our continuing agony our continuing exploration of what it means to live in a democracy, what it demands of us, what we can expect of it. It's a massive mirror onto which we project ourselves and history of course gives us bright reflections from a long away day. But at this particular moment, and this gets back to the Juneteenth, July 4th nexus, that we're promoting and that I hope Americans all celebrate and with the spirit in which Juneteenth renews July 4th. And, and that is to look at democracy or Republican government as Jefferson did, as an enlightened man did, as an experiment, as something that would test our potential to achieve a better world the pathos of Jefferson's career and his life is that those dreams did not come true, but he didn't think they would come true immediately. And this is what I want to conclude with and pass it on to, to Andrew. His notion was always that the rising generation, and that would be, there are no young people here tonight, but if there were, I would point to you. It's the, the living people who are gonna make this country was it what it is for their children. That notion of generational sovereignty, that's the genius of Jefferson's testimony. And that's why he stands out among the founders. The founders, Madison, his good friend, Hamilton and others labored hard to create the machinery of government in a difficult moment. And of course we honor them for what we take to be their success. But Jefferson understood that whatever was done in 1776 or in 1789 with the inauguration of the new federal government wasn't the end of the story. It was at best a prelude, a beginning, a hopeful beginning, but every hope is shadowed by fear. And these fears could only be allayed for somebody like Jefferson by imagining 
that a more enlightened generation, in other words, he's not saying to us, I know everything. I know what's going, what you're going to be like. I'm inventing you. I am inventing America. No, quite to the contrary. For all his achievement, for all his reading, for all his brilliance, Jefferson knew that he was radically imperfect. He didn't know everything. And he knew, and he had a sense of the improvement and progressive enlightenment over time, generation on generation. And it's this hope that we will be better than he and his colleagues were. I'd like to think, and what can you say about Jefferson? Jefferson lived in a white world. He didn't do anything, in fact, what he did probably strengthened the institution of slavery despite his testimony against it. Yet, I'd like to think, and of course, Annette will disagree with me and then I'll have to shut up. I'd like to think that he would endorse Juneteenth and he would say, if he read our histories of the period, he would say, you know, my approach my prescription, and I suggested that, yes, we emancipate the slaves and we send them to another place, expatriation. No, here we are. We're all Americans, and Jefferson wouldn't be Jefferson without the world he lived in, including the Hemingses and the enslaved people at Monticello. And it was the actual diversity of that world and the conflict and the friction and the struggles to make Jefferson's words in the Declaration real for everybody that have inspired Americans through their history. So I'm going to say, and this is uh, my contribution to current controversy, that we can forget that silly struggle about which is more important, 1619 or 1776, because they're both important moments. And 1776 is not a terminal moment. It's not a prize. This is not a zero-sum game. The year of the millennium, the year of history. No, instead, it's in the future we can hope and pray. Excellent. That Jefferson's vision will be redeemed. That Jefferson will be celebrating with us, as he imagines when he writes to John Adams about both of them, will end up, after life, looking down on the flow of history and celebrating the triumph of Republican government. And I hope that they'll both join us to celebrate Juneteenth as we continue to celebrate July 4th. Well, Peter, that was terrific. Um, I'm glad I'm taping this. I, I want to transcribe it, send it, to, no. send, it, send, it, send it to everybody as an op-ed. I mean, that, that was terrific. Um, we'll pick up on that a little later, um, but before we, we do, uh, I'd like to bring Andrew into the conversation. Andrew O'Shaughnessy is the Vice President of Monticello, uh, the Saunders Director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at the Thomas Jefferson Foundation and a Professor of History at the University of Virginia. His most recent book is The Illimitable Freedom of the Human Mind, Thomas Jefferson, Idea of... Um, Thomas Jefferson's idea of a university uh, that will be published, um, I think it's next month. We'll, I'll make sure that I get that. Correct, out. yes. Yeah, um, but you can certainly order it now and I'll give you the link. Uh, he's previously published The Men Who Lost America, British Leadership in the American Revolution and the Fate of the Empire, uh, which received eight national awards, including the New York Historical Society American History Book Prize, the George Washington Book Prize, the Society of Military History Book Prize, and the um, uh, he's also the author of Empire Divided, American Revolution, and the British Caribbean, uh, which was an alternate designate uh, selection for the History Book Club. Uh, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, he's the editor of the of Jeffersonian American Jeffersonian American. America series published by the University of Virginia Press. So with that, I am so very pleased to introduce Andrew O'Shaughnessy. Well, Roger, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Uh, the book uh, 
the official publication date is in September, but that it'll certainly, I think, be available in August. Um, I'm grateful to Peter for providing context uh, for the book. I should say, in the interest of disclosure, that the book is actually dedicated to Peter as a friend and a mentor. Uh, we first met while I was a graduate student in the mid 1980s, uh, after I'd completed my doctorate, uh, Peter wrote to me a several uh, page, single space typed letter when we didn't have computers, uh, telling me how to turn the thesis into a book. And I'll be eternally grateful. And he's had a profound effect on my thinking about uh, Jefferson. Jefferson, of course, thought that the founding of the University of Virginia was one of the, his three greatest achievements in life, along with the Declaration of Independence and also the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. Nevertheless, it's often uh, merely treated as an epilogue to his uh, career. Even biographies uh, pass through very quickly his retirement, uh, even books on Jefferson's retirement, and there are only a couple of them, have little to say about his founding of the university. And yet it was actually a very remarkable moment uh, because although many heads of state and history have acted as patrons of universities, there's really no parallel uh, to Jefferson's not only conceiving a university and creating it, but overseeing every detail. Uh, the university was largely what he called the a hobby of old age between the age of 73 and 83. As a lawyer, he drafted all of the bills to go through the legislature for the university. As a politician, he uh, devised the political strategy. And I think I'd learned more about Jefferson as a politician uh, doing this book than reading books on his uh, presidency. Uh, and I realized that in many ways, he was really quite a, a devious, but very able politician. As an architect, he actually designed the university, something that people only began to realize in the early 20th century. As an intellectual, he oversaw the curriculum, and one of the arguments of my book is that he anticipated in many ways the modern university. The main models at the time were Yale and Princeton, especially Yale that produced more um, heads of universities, uh, presidents, uh, professors than any other university in America and produced what was known as the Yale Report in the late 1820s that was to guide many universities right up through the Civil War. And yet uh, it stressed uh, redoubling down on the classics and the teaching of theology, whereas Jefferson's vision was uh, more vocational courses, uh, science courses, a much broader curriculum. Um, he even entertained every student to dinner. He'd invite them in groups of three or four every Sunday to Monticello. He'd have the professors come uh, and sometimes stay for several days. Uh, he wrote out the 6,000 books for the library that instantly became the second largest library in America. Uh, this was an extraordinary achievement. Um, it was undoubtedly probably one of the most costly public works projects other than the building of the Erie Canal and the building of Washington, D.C. I did see one historian estimate that um, uh, creating the University of Virginia involved more money than the entire endowment of Yale 
and the money spent on Yale since the time of its uh, creation. Now, I've not got many minutes. So what I really want to do is largely to just say what was distinctive about uh, the university, because what I've uh, tried to do is to master the history of higher education, both in this country and in Europe, to consider what was unique or what was different about Jefferson's uh, university from other universities at the time in America. Uh, I did like Peter's introduction because I think it's very important to emphasize that Jefferson understood and actually said that his own generation would be regarded by future generations much like his witch-burning ancestors. They'd seem equally backward. And part of his idea of the university was to help, help progress and to help improvements uh, uh, in the uh, university. Um, and uh, that the dead hand of the past should not hold back uh, the future, that each generation should rethink, like all of Jefferson's life and projects, it was tainted by the presence of slavery, but he certainly saw that as the most urgent issue of his day. He never set a, an agenda for the students and future generations, because that would go against his idea that the dead hand of the past shouldn't be making decisions for them. Uh, but that would have been one of the issues that he regarded as uh, needing to be addressed, uh, seeing that otherwise uh, there would be a bloodbath uh, and some kind of civil war. So these uh, quickly are what I think are the major distinctive features of the university he created. Uh, and these were going to have a great influence on universities throughout the United States. Uh, six presidents of Harvard took a particularly great interest in uh, Jefferson's university. In fact, Josiah Quincy, uh, who was inaugurated as president of Harvard soon after, uh, Jefferson died, um, he got down to Washington DC and was going to visit the University of Virginia, but the university was going through a pandemic. Um, and uh, as a result, he had to turn back and go back. It was a typhoid epidemic, um, but as a result, he never actually visited the university. But Henry Tickner, who was one of its most influential faculty and watched everything that was happening uh, at the university at the time, Tickner uh, consciously tried to implement uh, some of the distinctive features of Jefferson. The one that he was most attracted to was Jefferson's idea of an elective, of, um, an elective curriculum. That is, students could choose their own courses. Uh, they didn't need to stay within one subject area. To some extent, it was more liberal than the modern university where they often have to do foundational courses first. They're required to take certain courses. Uh, Jefferson made no requirements, but he did limit them to three subject areas uh, so that it, they had choice, but they also had uh, depth as well, and it seems to fit with his political views. The most radical part of his vision was not to have a chapel at the university uh, at a time when every other university in America had chapel usually at least twice a day, which students were required. They were religiously tolerant, but you're expected to go and furthermore, he had no department of theology. It was a secular university, and that was to make it actually quite unpopular in the early years and to cause student enrollment to be much lower. Other features were uh, having faculty governance rather than a president and also student self-governance. Again, the idea of devolved um, uh, power and political uh, leadership. 
He particularly stressed that it should be public. Um, he wanted lectures and examinations, which was rare at Harvard at the time. They were still doing recitation and they did not uh, examine students. This was something he imported uh, from Cambridge based on the Cambridge Tripos system. It was innovative with an emphasis on medical education. Columbia University actually closed down its medical school in the 19th century. And uh, most medical colleges in America were actually independent, completely independent of the university and had very little to do. I'm already overgoing my time. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there, but to suggest that this became a very important model, not only in America, but it also influenced University College in London, London University, which was the first university built in England outside of Oxford and Cambridge. Jefferson sent the founder of that his plans, and it bore great similarity and actually two of its first professors were former University of Virginia professors. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Andrew. I appreciate that. And I think with uh, Peter and Andrew, you've both given us a wonderful idea of the stamp of Jefferson in modern society. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask Annette um, with your um, uh, beyond on Juneteenth, m m so much of uh, your your work and your study had been on Jefferson. What what do you feel is Jefferson's modern relevance um, in 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 society? Well, I think certainly his ideas about education, which the importance of education in a democratic republic his ideas about separation of church and state. I know that that has gotten him into trouble in Texas. Uh, some years ago, there was a move to remove him from uh, uh, a place of prominence uh, because, of, because of that, the notion of separation of church and state. And I think right now there's a, a bill in Texas where, uh, I mean, that's, that they're sort of crossing out things that people typically talk about in school. And one of them was the letter to the Danbury Baptist, his letter huh. uh, there. So he is, he remains a controversial figure and a, a live issue because he's talking about things that are, are, are of core importance to uh, a Republican society. And they're gonna be some people who like them and some people who don't. So it's interesting to see him come up. I was going through the bill and see, looking at the places where things that were related to him uh, were, were X'd out. Um, they can talk about the declaration, but not the more controversial uh, points of, about him. So I think education, the importance of education and the critical importance of the separation of church and state, which he, he was very, he was adamant about um, are, are things that we should look to him uh, for today. Well, that's, uh, so basically you're saying that there are bills who want to cancel a certain piece of history is that what you're saying um yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know on that note uh, and this is even before the word cancel came up this started right. a long time ago. they replaced him with john calvin <laughs> you know on that on that note um and you all know that i i i've been eager to ask this question um given current events and civil and voting rights issues in 1619th and juneteenth and 1619 project and juneteenth and some of the reactionary uh propaganda and critical race theory that's been coming out and how, how should historians and music museum educational uh organizations uh public historians heritage societies how should we get what should we do what can we do to prepare for the upcoming semi-quincentennial celebrations uh peter what um let's see are you there Where's oh yeah i'm here yeah i was trying to hide but i couldn't get away from it uh, <laughs> what should you do <laughs> i don't know uh, it's going to be difficult, Roger. I think the, the, the big problem is we need a big tent 
uh, but we also, that is, we need to have an inclusive sense of who we are as a people. Uh, I think that is the core of our controversies right now. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that we agree to some, all agree about some big lie that we accept about. That is the old narrative of American history. That is what was supposed to be onward and upward and it's been getting better and better and it was always full. Well, it wasn't, but that doesn't mean we can't be better. So I think public history has and can play a continuing role in generating conversation and generating conflict. There are lots of great things to fight about. The thing that we should not fight about is that we have a shared identity and we depend on each other. Uh, that's the thing about independence, independence in the world. What does that signify? It means that we are among ourselves interdependent and for that matter, we're part of a larger world. I Thank think you. we take notions of liberty and autonomy and rights to the absurd extreme that we can no longer see each other. So I think public history is on the front lines of, uh, of citizenship education uh, and it's not easy, it's not pretty. I, I think we've come a long way in the last 15 or 20 years in interpreting at historic places like Monticello the reality of slavery and making Monticello not a safe place for anybody, but an engaging place, a place that's important to everybody. So uh, perfect lead in uh, for, for Andrew, uh, what, what is Monticello doing? <clears throat> to prepare for the uh, semi-quincentennial? It's, uh, we're going to be putting on a major exhibit on the Declaration of Independence, and we'll focus both on the positive and negative. Uh, you know, in the last few years, we've rebuilt the slave cabins at Monticello. We've, um, uh, unveiled Sally Hemings's room that we were able to identify. And we've addressed what the head of Monticello calls the best and the worst in America, the best being the declaration with its promise of inclusiveness, uh, its great poetical phrases of all men are created equal, uh, and the worst in reminding us that a fifth of the population was enslaved at the time of the American Revolution. <clears throat> I think the balance we want to strike is what Peter alluded to uh, at the beginning. He said, we need 1619 and 1776. And by that, he was using 1619 as a shorthand for what some see as an almost exclusively negative view of the worst in America. And 1776 is what its opponents see as a view that's entirely celebratory and takes us back to the way American history was taught 30 years ago. What we need is a nuanced version of the past that can acknowledge past wrongs, but that still re reinforces our democratic system and the value of the legacy of the past and the fact that whatever this original generation intended, uh, they created a, a foundation that we've been able to build up on with many other founders going right through to John Lewis in this, uh, these last decades um, who, who've been able to improve on this. And the great thing about Annette's work She's a real bridge builder. I told her I didn't know whether I should say I enjoyed her book on Juneteenth because it contains so many shocking things that even though I've been reading for many years and I lived a year in Dallas, Texas, and know I knew firsthand many of its problems, uh, there was still a lot that was new to me and shocking to me. And yet what comes out in that book is her love of Texas, her love of America, her belief still in the promise of Jefferson's words, and that still much can be achieved. Um, and 
that is important. Uh, I was thinking of you today, Annette. I was reading an article about race in Cuba, and Annette and I were in Cuba together, and our hosts really wanted to have Annette condemn uh, race in America and so forth, um, uh, which happens a lot when you're abroad. And she wouldn't go entirely with this and said, but I'm happy to talk about that, but what about race in this country? Uh, I don't see many black faces this uh, university and uh, you too had enslaved people and you have the same history as America. And this article written by a young professor at the University of Texas essentially reinforced this, that um, African Cubans have been excluded. Uh, the percentage of them at the university currently is incredibly low. In, in other words, this is a problem of many other cultures as well. And uh, America is a strong and great enough country that it can look at its history and yet still be proud and can talk about both because this is a good model for the rest of the world. Wherever I've gone and in my own country where I was born, Britain, no one really wants to talk about the negative. We want to tell a nice story. Uh, we really want to think of heritage, not history. And uh, so there's a lot that's very positive about this critical view, but we need to find a way to balance it with also stressing the good. Well, that's, that's terrific. I mean, speaking of bridging, and Annette, I'm gonna to come to you uh, next, but I wanted to ask Evelyn first uh, a question. Mm -hmm. Evelyn McDowell, first a question. You are the founder of the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage. You're also a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, that's a bridge. Can you, t can you tell us um, a little bit about how you, how you balance this and, and what are your conversations with the respective societies about uh, your, your research? Wow, that's a, that's a good question, uh, Roger. Um, I balance it because uh, by looking in the mirror, uh, and that is because you know I am the history. My I embody that. You know I I am I am a descendant from someone who fought for the American Revolution, who happened to be European, and I am a descendant from enslaved people. Um, my reality is the United States of America and what it is today. And it's it's mixture of, of these two realities. Um, I it, it, it is what it is. That's my saying, it is what it is. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 is, um, it is both, uh, you know, this, this, this wonderful idea that, uh, that people can live their life with freedom and liberty uh, and justice. And it hasn't gotten there yet, and I'm hoping that it will. Uh, but I, I also am, am, am a, um, a daughter of, of these uh, enslaved people who went through hell um, at, at this country. And so um, it is what it is. It's complex, uh, and, and it, is, um, it, it is what it is. Right. That's, that's how I deal with it. So... Um, Annette, I, I have the, because I'm in the publishing business, I get to look at everybody's sales figures and I, I see just how popular on Juneteenth has become. Um, what kind of reaction have you been getting um, to your recent uh, articles, the New York Times piece and the New York piece and the, and obviously, and with the new, with the new book, what, what what have you learned since you wrote the book and since the book has been published? I've gotten some really, really wonderful letters. I mean, this is one of the things that's different. I mean, the Hemings just came out in 2008 and there was an internet, but it wasn't like it is now with social media and ways to contact people. So I've heard 
from lots of people. And it's very nice to get letters from people. I've got a lot of letters from older people from, from Texas and white people, older white people from Texas who tell me that, you know, talk about their lives and how things like this in their family were not discussed, um, that, you know, that it was, they knew about racial prejudice, obviously, and they knew that their parents and, and people, that, and they themselves, and some of them said, you know, I've been a racist and I've been something that I've been trying to get over all of these years. It's sort of interesting and very, I would say I've gotten much more personal kind of letters than I typically get uh, because it's a personal book. And I wanted to try to touch people at that level, um, you know, sort of at a personal level. And I've gotten a, a really, really good response from it. And also I've gotten the greatest thing is getting letters from my mother's old students. Uh, people, my mother was a 10th grade English teacher and she had a lot of, she has lots of students out there and a number of them have written to me, black and white, um, talking about what she meant to them. So I get much, you know, I've got nice letters from other things that I've written, but for this book, I've got remarkably personal letters, mainly again, from older people and you know, from Texans who lived this society, black and white, who lived that particular world and are still trying to come to grips with it. Well, that's terrific. Um... You know, to sum this up, uh, it was something that Peter r referred to, the, the times that we are in, um, that, you know, I'm, the, when women bear children, um, it, it is a painful process. And, uh, but when a child is born, it is just glorious and, and everyone just is amazed with the miracle of birth. I think we are at a time of rebirth um, in America right now. Uh, just last week, I was um, at the National Congress of the Sons of the American Revolution. And um, I listened to a speech given by um, former Secretary of Defense General James Mattis, and it was a remarkable speech um, and, that talk of, talks about uh, this country that we live in, uh, very patriotic, of course, but very real. And I think what we've heard from our uh, speakers tonight, all four of them, uh, talk about the, the really the glory of what we are now about to come to. And I, I mentioned earlier, I, I asked this question of public historians facing celebrating our semi-quincentennial. And I think in the works of um, our authors that graced us with their time tonight, um, we have learned a lot just in this last hour. Uh, and I think when you read their books, uh, you will uh, be able to celebrate who who we who we are. Um, so I encourage everyone to uh, visit History Author Talks, look at the link, uh, and and um, uh, you'll do yourself a favor um, by reading their books. And I want to uh, give uh, very special thanks to Annette Gordon-Reed, Andrew O'Shaughnessy, and Peter Onuf uh, for their time uh, and their scholarship. And um, thanks also to our partner in history, Evelyn McDowell. Uh, this video is going to be available at historyauthortalks.com. You'll be able to see it on the past shows. Um, I'll be posting it on my Facebook page. I encourage you to uh, share this for those of you, uh, my audience, who have come to watch tonight's show. I invite you to share this uh, with all your, your friends uh, as well. Um, I do this for fun, uh, to promote, the, promote authors and promote books and promote scholarship. And um, if you want to go to 10crucialdays.org and give my um, organization a donation, that's always nice. Uh, but most of all, um, I want to thank you all for joining me uh, and celebrating these authors' works tonight. And uh, keep your eyes on historyauthortalks.com for future shows. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night.
Thank you.